You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art Ed? Try to spice it. Who art is Mr. Wood, <laughs> art Ed, me. Yeah. Either way, it, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted Weekly Art History for All Ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today we're digging into King Tut's tomb. On November 26th, 1922, Howard Carter prepared to enter the tomb of a little-known pharaoh. Nobody had set foot inside the space for over 3,000 years, but as Carter held up his candle, his partner, Lord Carnarvon, who had financed the expedition, called out asking if he saw anything. Carter responded, yes, wonderful things. King Tutankhamun, often referred to as King Tut, ascended to the throne at the tender age of nine during the 18th dynasty of the New Kingdom in Egypt, around 1332 BCE. Workers hastily completed his tomb as the boy king appeared to have died unexpectedly when he was just a teenager. While there are numerous theories as to how he passed, I am inclined to believe those who say he likely died from malaria or an infection. There were theories that he died in a chariot crash because of the chariots left in his tomb, along with numerous broken bones in the skeleton. However, DNA analysis indicated that Tutankhamun had a severe clubbed foot and other maladies likely stemming from the verticality of his family tree. Tutankhamun was physically frail, likely in a great deal of pain during his short life, and would not have been capable of riding chariots. The contents of the tomb also indicate Tut's disability. He was buried with 130 canes and walking sticks to aid him in getting around in the afterlife. Now, as a ruler, King Tut really was not all that remarkable. Probably his greatest achievement was restoring traditional religious practices. His predecessor, Akhenaten, um, also King Tut's father, I guess Tutankhamun's initial name was Tutankhaten, but he changed it as he took the throne as a sort of a signifier that he was getting away from his allegiance to his father, um, who was considered to be sort of a heretical king and um, sort of symbolically getting back towards the old religions. Akhenaten had undergone some drastic religious reforms, pushing everyone to worship Aten, the sun disk, as the primary god. Tutankhamun restored the polytheistic tradition, bringing back the priests and the temples that had been out of favor during that previous administration. He also moved the capital back to Thebes. He supported the arts and pushed to improve the economy, revitalizing trade networks that had suffered under Akhenaten. The thing is, while all of this sounds like he was restoring Egypt to normalcy after the radical reign of Akhenaten, he was still Akhenaten's son, so people associated the two of them together. He was likely just going along with his advisor's plans. Remember, Tutankhamun was only nine years old when he took the throne, so people like Nefertiti were likely just pulling the strings. When Tutankhamun died young, he left no children as heirs. Military strongmen came in to grab power, and the pharaoh Horneb uh, worked to erase Tut and Akhenaten from history. Horneb actually continued Tut's reforms and then took over Tut's monuments, carving his own name over Tut's wherever he could. Ironically, King Tutankhamun became a household name in the 20th century, because he was almost entirely forgotten 3,000 years ago. Because Tutankhamun wasn't spoken of and essentially erased from history so shortly after his death, he was quickly forgotten by most Egyptians, including would-be looters. As a result, his was the most fully intact tomb to be excavated in the 20th century. There were about 5,000 treasures in the tomb when Howard Carter and his team came in. It actually took them about a decade just to catalog and carefully remove everything. Now, from the looks of things, while Carter's team was very careful and meticulous removing everything, the ancient Egyptians had to rush the job as they filled the space. 
The stone sarcophagus, for example, has some unfinished details. Workers painted on some jewelry pieces that would normally have been carved. The lid was granite, but the base was quartzite. Archaeologists say that something must have happened to the original quartzite lid, and they simply made do with what they had on hand. A granite lid was carved and painted to look like quartzite, but repair work also indicates that the granite cracked during the rushed carving process. Things breaking and being hastily repaired appears to be the theme for King Tut. Probably the most famous treasure from the tomb of King Tutankhamun would be his burial mask. It's 22 and a half pounds, constructed of gold and precious jewels. A long stylized beard hung from the chin, but when Carter opened the tomb, the beard had broken off. They inserted a wood dowel rod to reattach the beard, but in 2014, some museum workers were cleaning the glass case when they accidentally broke the beard off. Apparently, in a move that seems way too relatable, they just hastily tried to cover their mistake by quickly gluing it back on and hoping nobody would notice. Unfortunately, the beard was slightly off-center, and people noticed some epoxy residue around where the pieces were connected. In 2015, a team of preservationists cleaned up the mess and reattached the beard using beeswax, which was kind of surprising to me, but I guess it was in line with ancient Egyptian methods. Why all the significance with the beard, you might be wondering? Great question. Glad I asked myself. The beard, like everything else about the mask, was symbolic. It was intended to connect him to the image of a god. The gold served the same function, as Egyptian gods were described as having skin of gold and bones of silver, hair of lapis lazuli. The burial mask was not a naturalistic depiction of the king as he looked in life, but rather an idealized depiction of what he would look like in the afterlife. He wears the Nem's headdress, the striped headcloth typically worn by ancient Egyptian pharaohs, and just above his forehead we see the vulture and cobra, symbols of goddesses watching over him and symbolizing his rule over both Upper and Lower Egypt. While his innermost coffin was made of gold, it did not appear shiny when Carter and his team first encountered it. Carter described the coffin as being pitch black from the hands to the toes as it had been covered in some liquid for a ritual anointing. In his hands were the crook and flail, symbols of the king's right to rule. The goddesses Nekbet the vulture and Wajet the cobra are spreading across his torso, inlaid in semi-precious stones. Beneath them, we can see two more goddesses, Isis and Nephthys, etched in gold. All of these treasures because the Egyptian pharaohs spent most of their lives planning for the afterlife. From the moment they ascended to the throne, rulers would have crews building tombs guarded by walls, secret entrances, traps, and spells. In yet another great bit of irony, the tomb that appears to have been the most hastily constructed also appears to have been the best preserved. Tutankhamun was allowed to rest in peace for well over 3,000 years until Howard Carter came around to dig up the king's remains. And though his reign may have been short, the treasures found in Tutankhamun's tomb have given him an outsized place in the history books and popular culture. If you want to learn a little bit more about ancient Egyptian art, check out the episodes linked in the show notes. And as always, if you enjoy this show, please tell a friend about it or do me a favor and leave a kind rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.